So uh, we finally moved to Palos Verdes, and I finished up uh, high school there. And after high school, um, I went to uh, I went to Europe for the summer with two of my buddies. Uh, actually, my mom encouraged us to go. It was uh, she thought it would be great, and it was. It was a wonderful trip. But at the end of the trip, I remember standing on the end of the runway by myself. It was night. And it was raining, and I was watching my plane take off for home. I wasn't on the plane. I was 18, and I was stuck in Prestwick, Scotland. And I had little money, no passport, no plane ticket. And the only friends I'd had um, in the continent were on that plane flying away. So I was pretty lonely at the time. Um, What had happened was... um, the trip, you know, to Europe with the three of us was fun. We, you know, we did all the big things. We went to London and Paris, and we spent time in the French Riviera. And, and Steve and I went to Rome while Larry went and visited his girlfriend in Switzerland. And we went to Munich, and uh, we went to Berlin, which is an interesting story because it was East. We went to East Berlin as well, and Copenhagen, and others. Anyway, we had a great time and generally stayed out of trouble. Um, but on the train on the way up from London up to Presswick to catch our plane, it was nighttime, and we were sleeping on the train in our compartment. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, and there was a uh, guy in our apartment compartment who appeared to be a little bit drunk, and he was messing with our stuff. And I, I ran him out, didn't pay much attention, but... Um, when uh, we got to the airport and I was going through all my paperwork, I noticed my passport was missing. So um, uh, I immediately went up to the airline and they explained to them what had happened. And uh, I had passport number. I had military ID as a dependent. I had, you know, I had all kinds of, you know, California driver's license, all that kind of stuff. They said, no passport, you're not getting on the plane. So... Uh, the, the closest place um, that I could um, get a passport uh, was in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, Edinburgh is on the east coast of Scotland. Presswick is literally on the west coast of Scotland. So uh, I was on the other side of the country. Luckily, Scotland, Scotland is nowhere near as wide as the United States, but nevertheless, it's a reasonably uh, good trip. So I um, I jumped in a uh, cab and took it to the train station in uh, uh, Gatwick or in uh, Glasgow because Glasgow was um, about halfway, roughly speaking, between the two. But I I missed my train. And the next train wasn't going to get me to town in time. So I had to get another cab, and I took the other cab to Edinburgh. So I took taxis all the way across Scotland, and I arrived at the consulate, and it was closed. Well, it's Sunday. Uh, There was a little plaque at the bottom of the door or side of the door that said, you know, go see this guy if it's an emergency. So I went to the consul general's home in um, in Edinburgh, and uh, he wasn't there, but I hung out on his steps because his neighbor said he'd be back soon. Well, he was really a nice guy. He really was very helpful, and he said he didn't understand why they wouldn't let me on the plane with my existing ID because it was certainly more than adequate to get a new passport. And then he'd be happy to give me this passport, except for the fact that uh, there was no way to get a photo taken on a Sunday. Now, these were, these were the days where there was no digital photography. It was all, you know, film, or they had to have it developed. And so you had to have your picture taken by, like, a real camera in a real photography studio and then have them develop. And it was a real pain. Um, and not only was there nobody open on Sunday that would do it, you know, it wasn't something that was done instantly like it is today. So, uh I I uh I was told 
or by the consul general to head back to the airport, see if I could get on, because I do have, you know, good enough information. And then if all else fails, come back and you'll send me a passport. So, uh, so I took the train um, uh, for, uh, to Glasgow, and uh, from Glasgow I took a cab back to the airport. And uh, it took me a long time to do this, but I did get back uh, and noticed that the plane had, you know, was still there, but they wouldn't let me on the plane. So um, I watched everybody leave, so I was stuck. So I decided I really wanted to get home, and they said that if I arrived back uh, by, I don't know, I think it was 2 o'clock the next day or 3 o'clock the next day, the, uh, there was a plane coming in that was from Amsterdam, and they would try to get me on board. So I said, okay, well, uh, so I I took a um, I took a cab to the train st- station in Glasgow, where I spent the night in the station, train station, got kicked out you know, moved around a few times as I was sleeping in the wrong places. And then finally, the train show up, and I jump on the train, and I take it to Edinburgh, where I camped out at the photography studio until he opened up and uh, convinced him that I really needed this thing right away. And so uh, for extra money, of course, he agreed to do it. So he's, you know, developing pictures and stuff, and I run up to the, to the embassy and got all the paperwork done ran back down, got the picture, ran back up to the airport, at the consulate, and they finally got a new passport. And then I went hauling ass down to the train station and watched my train pull out of the station without me. So here I am. Uh, I've got a passport, but i got to catch this plane. So I jumped back in a, ner- in a, in a cab and had him take me basically all the way back uh, to the airport. I didn't even try to stop and get a tr- train in Glasgow because, well, you can't because there's no train from Glasgow to Presswick. So I had the guy take me the whole way. And um, uh, uh, the train, the plane was still there. I was running late, but the plane was running late too and was still there. But they wouldn't let me on the plane. So now I'm screwed. I got a passport. I have hardly any money. Uh, I don't have a ticket home. Um, and uh, guys that were there from the airline, which was TIA, Trans, Trans International Airline, they all took off and went back to London, which is where their office was. And I'm here in the airport by myself, at least as far as the airline was concerned. Um, uh, and so I slept in the airport for a couple of nights, and uh, I was sitting around just basically – uh, making sure everybody knew I was still there. I didn't want people to forget me. So I was polite. I was nice. I was kind. I was, you know, I didn't make any trouble, but I also obviously, I was obviously there all the time. And one of the airlines, there weren't very many, but they, and they kind of knew what was going on, uh, handed me a telegram. And that telegram was from TIA people, and they said that uh, a plane was coming in uh, later that day and that um, I could get on it and ride it to London if I wanted because they thought London would be a better place for me to get a uh, an airline out to the United States. Uh, so uh, I jumped on the plane. It was an empty plane and took it down to to uh, Gatwick Airport. Now, it was kind of fun. The plane was empty, and I was a young kid, and there were lots of cute fl- flight attendants, and so we had pillow fights and stuff on the way down. It was fun. We had a good time. So so now I'm in London, and I, I'm even more lost, you know, big city and all that kind of crap. So I get out of the airport or get out of the, air, uh, the airline, and I walk over to the TIA office to see if I could figure out what's going on. And I ran into Dan Dent. Now Dan was one of the one of three airline representatives that uh, worked for TIA. Uh, the other Jeff, I don't know Jeff's last name. He was a British um, a national who was in charge of the catering for TIA, and Dan handled maintenance issues. And then the uh, passenger rep was Frederick Fieldkirker, who was a German national, and um, they were real stickler for. Uh, 
for the, uh, you know, uh, for the rules. But anyway, um, at least at this point, I had finally broken down. Well, before I left London, I broke down and left for London. I broke down and called my folks. Now, uh, I hadn't called them earlier because, you know, transatlantic phone calls are really expensive. So you don't do it in a whim. And, of course, nobody had ever even heard of cell phones in those days. So, um, you know, it was a different time. You didn't make a phone call on the spur of the moment. People didn't hang around talking on the phone. So I called my folks and told them what was going on, told them I was okay. And Mom said she would try to send us some money uh, to the American Embassy, I mean, the American Express office um, in London. Now, American Express in those days used to have offices uh, all over the world in uh, major uh, centers where you could actually have mail delivered and you could get, you know, cash your American Express checks for local currency or buy them or whatever. Anyway, it was a nice place. There were always, you know, folks around. And uh, so I went in there. Uh, she said she would send me some uh, um, some money if she could. So anyway, um, I ran into Dan Dent, and Dan was uh, sympathetic and said, why don't you just stay in my place? I've got room, and you can crash there until we figure this out. So that was a wonderful thing to happen because I didn't know what I was going to do. And London, obviously, was a big, big city. So um, – I crashed at Dan's place, and um, I went to the uh, next day or the day after, I don't remember now, he had to take off on business and go up to, I don't know, Manchester or something for a flight. So uh, uh, I went into London that day and went to American Express, and there were a couple of letters for me, one from a hotel that we had stayed at in Berlin. I guess they owed us some money, and uh, they sent it to American Express, their office there in London, which was nice. And so I picked up that letter, and um, and then there was a letter from my mom, but with a uh, hundred bucks. And she had uh, she had mentioned that Don had fallen over backwards through a plate glass window, and he was okay. But I always wondered whether that was an accident or whether he was screwing around. It it broke the window. It just gave him the, you know the uh, excuse. I have to ask you about that someday. Anyway, uh, so it was nice to have a little bit of money. A hundred bucks doesn't sound like a lot today, but in those days, that was a, that was a lot of money. And um, uh, I, so it was good to have that money. And then the little bit that was in the check, I Dan Dent took me to his bank and were able to cash it there. And uh, it didn't amount to about a money, bunch of money, but since I didn't have much money, that was was nice to have a little bit of extra. So um, uh, I got the got the money and uh, went to the American Embassy while I was there to see if they could help, and they didn't. They weren't willing to do anything for me. They sent me the American Aid Society to make a phone call home, but you know I had already made a phone call home, so I didn't need that. Well. Um, I got I was kind of pissed at the embassy for a long time, uh, but then I realized later that uh, you know the American embassies are not there with their primary mission is to protect Americans who get themselves in trouble. No, they have other um, more important reasons, and um, you know they would have helped that I really had some need. But frankly, at that point, I didn't have any. They're not going to give me money to fly home, you know. Um, although I think I was naive enough to believe it at the time that they would do that, but who knows. So anyway, um, so I'm staying at Dan's, and um, uh, he had taken off for business to uh, uh, Manchester, and he was to leave a key to the house. Well, he uh, forgot, and I went to a couple of different airports looking for him and looking for the key and couldn't get a key and finally gave up, took the train back to his house and forgot where he lived. Uh, you know, I hadn't driven ahead and I just kind of followed him the first night. So uh, I kind of wandered into a police station. I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but 
uh, I wandered in and um, uh, there was a, a map of the town up on the on the thing, and I managed to recognize his street. So I backed out of the police station real quick, went to his house, and sure enough, no key there either. Uh, but I noticed a window that was open kind of high, and he lived in a townhouse, I guess, with a nosy neighbor, and he told me later he was really surprised that she hadn't called the police on me, but I got lucky, I guess. So I found a ladder, and I found a, a rake, a regular old rake, and so I, the ladder, I used the ladder to crawl up to the window, which was too small and really not effective for me to get in, but I got the, the rake in it, and I used the rake the long rake of the prongs at the end to unlatch another window that I could get in. So I broke in their house and I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and there was all this luggage there. Um, and it wasn't Dan's luggage. It was his wife's luggage. Now his wife had been on vacation and wasn't expected home for a while, but she came home early when I'm feeling well, I guess. And, uh, uh, I didn't know who she was. And here I am sleeping in her house. Um, so I thought, oh, man, this is going to be weird. So I was downstairs waiting, and uh, finally she got up and came down. And I, I let her get into the kitchen and kind of get settled. And I finally went in there. And, of course, she looks at me like, who in the hell are you? And I uh, quickly started talking, hoping I could, um, you know, convince her it was okay. And as soon as I opened my mouth, I could tell there was some relief because I was German. I mean, I was... Uh, an American, she was an American, and there were no other, probably no other Americans in the whole town. And so, uh, besides she and I and her, and her husband. So she calmed down a little bit when she realized I was not a local, and uh, finally I convinced her that her husband actually had allowed me to stay there. Um, so it worked out okay. Well, uh, Dan got home that night, and they had a big laugh, thought that was funny. And then the next day, uh, I was handed the ticket under the table. Uh, Jeff, their English uh, compatriot, had helped me out and got me a ticket in. And uh, uh, I went through customs and all that kind of stuff and was about ready to get on the plane when two representatives from the airline had the ticket and the new ticket for came up to me and started asking me questions for which I didn't know the answer. Apparently, I was a... I got the ticket because somebody said that I was an employee of TIA Airline, and they were giving this to me as a courtesy, uh, but they decided they would confirm it with me, and nobody bothered to tell me that the ticket was issued to me because I was an employee. So they kicked me off the plane, took the ticket away. So that sucked. So the next day, they gave me another ticket on another plane. I think this one was on. New Caledonia Airlines, and this time it was to, uh, where did I, well, the first time was Detroit, the first ticket, and uh, so I sent my folks a, a telegram and said, you know, I'm going to Detroit, and I didn't go to Detroit, so I sent them another telegram, so I'm not going to Detroit, I'll let you know, so I figured, oh, I'm not going to be sending telegrams, because they're expensive, and I don't have enough money to do this, so, um, the next flight the next day was to um, Toronto, and I just didn't I didn't tell anybody. I got I, I got on the plane okay, so that worked out. But then I'm sitting there, and the flight attendants are standing next to me, and they're talking about the fact that they have one too many passengers on board. Of course, that was me. And they thought, well, they said something to the effect, well, maybe somebody got on early, and I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and about that time, the pilot comes on and says, there's a mechanical problem on the plane. Everybody has to get off. So I went, oh, shit, I'm sure they're going to do a double check going back on to see who this extra passenger is. But they didn't. And I got on, and they took off right away. I guess they figured they were running late. Well, this was, a, um, this was in the old days. This was an old prop, turboprop plane. Um, and... You know, it was going to have trouble getting across the Atlantic without another stop. So it stops in Presswick, um, and to pick up more passengers and more fuel. And sure enough, the ground crew there was the same ground crew that had helped out 
uh, TIA, and they all recognized me, and they congratulated me on finally getting a flight home. And, uh, of course, I was trying to make them keep quiet because I didn't want to get in trouble again. But uh, I didn't. Uh, I missed it, missed the, uh, um, the badness that day and was able to get back on the plane and fly to Toronto. And in the process of flying to Toronto, I talked to my seat partner uh, and told him what was going on. And he offered me a place to stay at his house overnight when we got to Toronto, which was really good news. And then uh, he helped me get on the bus the next day. And I took the bus from Toronto to Chicago. And in Chicago, I finally called my parents and uh, told them I was back and asked them if they would send me a standby ticket to uh, Oakland from St. Louis. And I when I took that bus down to St. Louis, stayed with my grandmother for a few days, which I think was um, was nice. She probably really enjoyed it, although I'm not sure she knew what to do with me. But, you know, we had a, a nice visit. And then I took a cab out to the airport and took my uh, – uh, use my standby ticket. In those days, you could buy standby tickets and um, you know just hang out until a plane arrived. And sure enough, I got a flight, but it was a flight uh, to Oakland via Los Angeles, which was weird. So um, I got on the flight and I went to Los Angeles, and they gave me a transfer um, to catch my flight to Oakland, and. Um, I showed I didn't ever see one of these, and I showed it to somebody, and he says, "Yeah, it's just a transfer. You can get a go over and get it." And he says, "Oh, this is interesting. They didn't date it. Of course, I didn't know they were supposed to." And um, he said that uh, you know this is good anytime. Come back tomorrow, and I got thinking, "Oh hell, I'll just go home and come back later." So I called my folks. Nobody answers. So um, I thought, "Well, what the hell?" So I went outside and grabbed a bus. You know, I've been doing this for for days anyway, for weeks anyway, months actually, got the bus and took the bus to the end of the line. It didn't go anywhere near my folks' house. But at the end of the line, Steve Cass lived about two blocks away. So I walked to his house, and after he picked himself up from falling down and laughing, he was an odd duck. Anyway, Steve drove me home to my folks, and uh, they showed up, you know, five minutes later, and you know, we had a great reunion and all of that kind of stuff. And then literally two weeks later, I went back to the airport, showed them my transfer, and they um, flew me to San Francisco, and then they put me on a helicopter and flew me to Oakland. Now, I wanted to go to Oakland because that's where TIA's headquarters was, and I wanted to get my money back. You know, I mean, you know it cost me a lot of, a lot of effort uh, and money the extra money to stay in in uh, Europe, and uh, you know, I was told by State Department that that wasn't necessary. So uh, I decided to raise some hell about it, and I went in and started talking to these guys. And of course, they denied everything. You know, no, 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 you're home. You don't need to, you know, blah, 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 blah. blah. So they weren't going to give me shit. So I was leaving, and I decided I would sort of a break the bad news to them since they weren't going to help me out. Uh, I had been at the airport so long in London that I got to know the BOAC, British Overseas uh, Airline Company, which is now part of uh, uh, British Airways. But BOAC in those times, in those days, was the representative that TIA used to uh, help them. You know, they had a desk for them and they could provide equipment and, you know, they would provide, um, you know, uh, staff on the, on the runway and things hmm. and TIA would pay for it. But, uh, they, you know, they didn't have all this stuff themselves cause they didn't have enough flights to justify it. Well, BOAC was so pissed off at this Frederick Fielkerker, the German passenger rep who wouldn't let me on the airplane because he was such an asshole to him, literally. They were not going to renew the uh, the arrangement to allow TIA to continue to leave the land there. So this was going to be devastating in TIA because they weren't going to have a place to land in London. So I broke the news to them, 
And you could tell by looking at their faces they had no idea this was going on. And I had enough information that they it was clear they they knew I had I had uh, some um, uh, you know I had more it was more than just a casual sort of deal. Um, and that's when I left. Now the only thing that happened after that that was positive or it was anyway interesting was that. Uh, I found out later that Frederick Fieldkirker got fired, and so I was happy about that. I guess every dog has this day. Anyway, that was my that was my adventure when I was 18 uh, in in Scotland.